so we're all wired in real different ways. And when we respond to difficult situations, we all respond differently, don't we? What are some of the ways that you, or maybe somebody you know, responds in a difficult situation? What's something you can think of? This is the part where you talk back. This isn't rhetorical. Yeah. 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 <laughs> That's the first thing. I love it. I love it. So you, you're getting mad because now it's like, ah, there goes all my money. All right. So, yeah. And then you have this amazing scar on your hand that I don't ever want to look at. Yeah. Yeah. What are some other reactions that people have in difficult situations? We got anger and like, ah, oh, junk. Now I got to. Yeah. Yeah. What, what are some other things you can think of or something that you do? Maybe it's not anger, but maybe it's something else. Yeah. 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 Like you like you determine, I'm going to fix this. Whatever this is, I'm going to do something to make sure that never happens again. Right? Okay. So we get real analytical. Like, okay, this happened because I woke up 10 minutes earlier than I normally did, and I had Pop-Tarts instead of cereal. And, you know, and you start like putting all this together, and then suddenly like the Illuminati are in your backyard. Okay. I get it. <laughs> All right, what's something else? Is there like a different thing you can think of how we respond to difficult silence, right? What do you do in that silence, though? You just, is it one of those, like you just kind of like, kind of silent or just like real introspective, like, why is this always happening to me? Or is it just kind of like, <laughs> I don't know. There's a lot of different things. So what else? What'd you say? Denial. Yeah, what was that? Finding Nemo? Denial. <laughs> yeah, we, yeah. When, when bad things are happening, we just want to say, no, nah, this, this ain't happening to me. No way. And then stress is what you said. Yeah, most of us would get stressed out when bad things start happening. Um, other ways you can, you can think of is like, it's just this passive resignation where it's like, you think that whatever's happening is never going to get better. Or you're just like, why does this, this always happens to me? You know, so we get mad, we get introspective, we get passively resigned, we get real analytical, we go quiet, we get stressed. All of this stuff happens, and this is part of the normal human experience, okay? So if you're thinking, oh, I do that, I better not do that, he's about to drop a bomb. No, 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 I'm not. That's what we all do, okay? I get so mad when bad things start happening. I just like, oh, why? Oh, you know, and not, I mean, that's, pretty accurate but <laughs> when when stuff starts to just go down I'm just like I am gonna pick this ship up and it is not gonna sink you know and I just get angry I said ship with a P okay some of you guys are like what happened <laughs> we're gonna subtitle this on YouTube it's gonna be like <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah that's essentially what I, I'm like, I'm, I'm like him. I'm always angry. Um, but who chooses joy? When stuff starts to fall apart around you and difficult things start happening, who chooses joy? Who's just like, yay, I failed. Ah! And you have that weird looking face. Here's the deal. I want you guys to go to 1 Peter 4. We're going to read 12 through 19, okay? 1 Peter 4, 12 through 19. When you get there, look at me so I know you're there. And then you can look back down so you can read along. Okay, cool. Fantastic. Let's go. 1 Peter 4, 12 through 19. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice inasmuch as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when His glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you're blessed. For the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Verse 15, if you suffer, it shouldn't be as a murderer or thief or any other kind of criminal or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. For it is time for judgment to begin with God's household. And if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it is hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Verse 19, So then, those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful Creator 
and continue to do good. Now why am I telling you all this? Well, the point today is that our faith won't fail when we choose joy. Our faith won't fail when we choose joy. Write that somewhere. Write it on your heart if you don't got a pen. Our faith won't fail when we choose joy. Now let's pray for the rest of our time. Jesus, we love you, and we thank you that you endured the cross because of joy. Who, for the joy set before him, endured the cross, despising its shame, and is set down at the right hand of God. Thank you for that. Thank you for that example. Now, I pray that you would help us understand what is meant by choosing joy and rejoicing in suffering, because it is a confusing thing. And I pray that any words I speak are the words of Jesus and not something clever. Jesus, we love you. In your name, amen. Um, really, really happy people creep me out. Like the really, really happy ones, like this, or, or this, or this. Like, I feel like I'm the baby in this picture when I'm surrounded by really, really happy people. I'm just like, I'm that baby, all right? I don't know if you guys can relate, but that just let that, I'm going to leave that up there. We're going to let that burn in your head. But I don't know. Is anybody else creeped out by, like, overly joyful people? It's okay to admit that, all right? And if you're overly joyful, dial it down a notch. Look how many people are creeped out by you. Not really. I don't want to stifle your joy. But it is weird because why? Because when we think about, like, overly joyful people, it's always just kind of like one of these, like, <laughs> smiles. It's like just one step away from breaking down and melting away into tears, right? It's like, <laughs> everything's good. <laughs> oh, my God. You're like, that's what I imagine, all right? And the overly joyful, there's nothing wrong with being joyful. As Christians, we're supposed to be joyful. Our hearts are supposed to be overflowing with mirth, all right? That's why when you see me, I'm not just like, what's up? Let's talk about Jesus. I love Jesus. I love what he did for me at the cross. I love that he's not dead. I love that I'm redeemed. And because of that, there is joy in the depths of my soul that overflows a lot in front of you. But when I'm around people, that it, it, there's some that you just, you know, are faking it, right? It's just like, I don't believe you right now when you say that it's all good. And this happens on Sunday mornings a lot. You walk into church, how you doing? I'm, I'm, I'm blessed. Man. I am blessed. Shut up. <laughs> Tell me how you really are. I'm blessed. No, stop that. How are you really? I mean, man, what a, how great would it be to get there? The reason that I think that, that I'm creeped out by the overly joyful is because I know my own heart. I know that it is much easier to be pleasant and move on than to be real and stay long. Because if you just say, hey, I'm good. Peace out, brother. Bye. You don't have to be real with anybody. But if, if, if I came up and I said, how are you doing for real? This is going on. Then we're locked in for a while, right? It's so much easier to just be pleasant and move on than to be real and stay long. Here's the deal. When I was in college, I worked at Six Flags as a trash man. Greatest job I ever had. <laughs> And one of the things that they did at Six Flags is they hired a lot of Europeans. Um, like, I worked with some Slovakians that I love. Martin Krupa. Oh, that guy was awesome. And there were some Polish guys I worked with that called me Pastor Sean. <laughs> like, they were just awesome. But what was awesome about them was they would ask you, how are you? And they would mean it. Like, they would stand there and go, like, no, really, how are you today? Are you, are you okay? Is there anything I can do for you? And when you ask them, hey, how are you doing, Martin? Oh, well, let me tell you. Look, I... I didn't, I didn't mean that. <laughs> I meant like, hi, bye, I got to sleep. But those guys got it. Like, they would actually tell you how they're doing. They weren't like faking like, oh, I am so blessed to be working in America. Like, they didn't do that. It was just like, man, it is hot here. <laughs> and there's a guy um, that I know that one, not too long ago, he asked me that. He goes, hey, how, how are you today? And I said, ah, I'm okay. And he goes, no, you're not. You're better than that. I was like, how do you know? Don't force that on me. Don't make me rise up to this fake joy that I'm, I'm not ready to share that with you. Man, you're better than that. You're blessed. You're, God, 
God is good all the time. I know that. But right now, I'm not there. When they're overly joyful, they're, they just kind of creep me out. But here's the thing. There's a difference in acting like nothing's wrong and having supreme confidence that Jesus will keep his promises. Acting like nothing's wrong is like, oh, let's put this cute picture of us with our baby and oh, everything's great. We haven't slept in three weeks, but it's all good. Oh my God. But having supreme confidence in Jesus is so much better than just saying like, hey, it's good. It's a good Sunday. I wish I was at the lake. But, hey, it's, it's, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. We don't want to fake joy. We want to have supreme confidence that Jesus keeps his promises. So where's the balance? Well, look at verse 12 and 13. Let's go back to this. This is awesome. Verse 12 and 13. It says, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice inasmuch as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. So if you got your own Bible or you got one of those, like, you can take notes, circle rejoice and overjoyed or just make a note of that. Like, that's important. We, we want to talk about this word rejoice for the purpose of being overjoyed, right? So Peter, what he's saying here is he's saying, hey guys, guess what? When you suffer, not if, when you suffer, choose joy. When you suffer, rejoice. When that happens, choose to be joyful. Why? If, look in verse 13. There's a phrase there that answers the why question. What's that phrase? Justin, you got it? Verse 13, why? There's a, there's a little two-word phrase that answers the why question. So that, yeah, so that what? What's the reason? Yes, that's why we choose joy, so that we may be overjoyed. Now here's the thing about overjoyed. That word, when you like break it down, it means much leaping, <laughs> okay? It's not just like, oh, yay, I'm, like it's much leaping. It's kind of like this clip of a uh, Indiana buzzer beater. Check this out. Just watch the crowd. This is what overjoyed looks like. That's their coach, by the way. <laughs> look at that. That is a buzzer beater against number one Kentucky. I mean, look at that. That's just, that is overjoyed right there. There's much leaping going on in this place. It's much leaping. <laughs> Come on. Many much leaps are going on right now. You ever been in that situation where you've been at some athletic event or band concert or whatever, and you're just like, yeah, you just can't stop jumping. You're storming the court, guy with a unibrow's mad. You know, it's just all kinds of <laughs> – look at all this. They can't they, – they have to jump. What is with that? What's with that in our hearts? I'm going to go back to this. We have to jump when we're overjoyed. It's like, oh, there's just much leaping. It's like a lamb that's just like, yeah. When we're overjoyed, that's our response. We just, oh, like, why am I moving right now? That's what happens when you're overjoyed. Okay, now here's the deal. Here's the deal. You choose joy now in your suffering so that you can be overjoyed then. Catch this. This is the biggie. When we suffer, when we suffer, when we're in the midst of suffering, we're not supposed to be going, yay, yay, this sucks so bad. Oh. That's not what Scripture is telling us to do. What Scripture is saying is that when you suffer, when things are going down at home that you wish weren't, when things are going down at school that you wish weren't, you choose joy. Because in the future, you won't suffer choose joy now, which isn't faking like everything's okay, but it's trusting that the promises of Jesus are going to be fulfilled. And when you choose that joy, then when Jesus splits the sky and comes back, there's going to be much leaping. <laughs> and we're going to be overjoyed because we chose joy now in our suffering. We're not like, yes, 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 suffering. Ugh. We're like, hey, you know what? <laughs> it's going to be better than this someday. And I can't wait for that. It hurts now and it stings now, but it was not going to forever because I trust Jesus. I believe Jesus. I know he's coming back. And when he does, oh, it's going to be good. Are you, are you 
you're kind of tracking with that now, what rejoice in your suffering means. I want to peel it apart a little bit more. Let me see. I want to get past this a little here again. Um, I used to struggle with this idea that rejoice was like um, the same thing as enjoy. Like what, we, what I just kind of demonstrated there with like when you suffer, you have to just put on a smile or else you're not a good Christian. Anybody ever felt that before? Like, if I'm supposed to rejoice in my suffering, how the heck do I do that? What am I supposed to look like? What am I supposed to sound like? What am I supposed to do? Because this really hurts. And I don't know if I can just go, yeah, it's all good. It's all good. And just strain to put that smile on your face on Sunday. And then you go home and it's just like. So what do we do? Here's the deal. I want to I wanna break this apart for you. There's a difference between rejoicing and enjoying something. There's a difference between rejoicing and enjoying. They're, they're very close when you define these words. But the subtlety and the difference is so huge for us as followers of Christ. Let me help you out. Um, when you enjoy something, you take pleasure in it. When you rejoice, you're in a state of gladness. All right, so subtle differences. It's still, it's all good. You enjoy something, you rejoice, it's, it's good. It's a good situation. When you enjoy, I want you to key in on this part. When you enjoy something, it's like you're savoring it. When you rejoice, you're reveling in it, like you're making merry, you're boisterous. Okay, now here's, here's the thing. April makes fun of me for this all the time. That's my wife, April, back there. Everybody turn and look because she hates it when I do that to her. She makes fun of me for this all the time. Like when we go out to eat and I really like what I'm eating, I'll take a bite and I'll just go, oh, yeah! <laughs> you know? Maybe not that loud, but I'm like, I'm very vocal that I approve of this steak. Like, mm, mm. That's combining enjoyment and rejoicing at the same time, all right? I'm savoring a bite, but I'm also making merry and being boisterous about it. The two are separate in the suffering of the believer. Enjoyment is to savor something. It's like if you ate a great steak, and you're just like, oh, mm. and you chew it slower than normal. You just want all those juices. You just want to taste every bite. You know, and you're just like, you know what? I'm not swallowing this thing fast. I'm just going to let it sit there for a while. I'm going to roll it around. Oh, I touch every taste bud, you know. <laughs> and then you're like, oh, there's more. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know? Or if you're not a steak person, it's okay. It's like sitting in a hot tub after a long day of skiing or something. And you just kind of like go, oh. You know that feeling? Come on, you know that feel. That's savoring a hot tub, savoring a steak, or you're like savoring a vacation. You know, when you go out to the beach and you just open up that sliding glass door and you walk out on the sand and all you hear is like, oh, and nothing else. And you're just like, this is heaven. I better get out my selfie stick. <laughs> you know? And then you ruin it by doing that. But... But it's like you're standing there and you're savoring the moment. You're just letting it soak in and permeate every part of you because you love it so much. That's what enjoyment is. Enjoyment is a passive thing. Rejoicing is an active thing. If you're enjoying something, you're letting things happen to you. And you're just like, ah, ah. You're just laying down, getting a massage or something. Like, ah, this is so good. Rejoicing is you're actively saying, I choose joy now. I choose to revel in this. I choose to be excited about this. Now, here's the thing. If you're enjoying something, you're sitting and you're savoring it. You're, you're loving every moment of it. But think about rejoicing is like all those parables that Jesus told of like the lost coin, the lost sheep, the lost son. All right? And at the end of every one of those parables, what happens? Does anybody know this or have a good guess at this? They rejoice, right? The widow that loses her coin, it's like it's a coin. But she calls in all her neighbors and she says, rejoice with me. I found it. When the sheep is returned, rejoice with me. I found my lost sheep. When the son comes home, rejoice with me. We're having a barbecue. He's home. Rejoice. 
They're glad that it's over. There's rejoicing at the end of this thing. Enjoying something is like a process of it. And rejoicing is the finality of something. You enjoy the moment that you're in. You enjoy the vacation. You enjoy the big screen TV that you're getting because your parents are paying for it. You enjoy the steak at Mahogany's or Red Rock. You enjoy that stuff. And it's this process of it. But when you rejoice, you're like, oh, thank God, it's over. It's time to party. We're done. All right. When, another way to think of it, when you enjoy in suffering, you don't enjoy it. You don't sit there and you let it soak and think, ah, oh, this feels so good. But when you rejoice, you say, I know that this will be over. So in faith, I am happily exalting God who promises this will all be good in the end. So to illustrate this, I brought this up last week, but we had a, a, a family situation that I hated every moment of it because there was a woman in my daughter's school who chose to target my daughter and throw accusations against her that she was hurting her kid and all this stuff. And I was just like, I said a couple choice words on the phone to my wife, and that was it, because I was very level-headed with everybody else I talked with, but you can imagine when somebody is unjustly accusing a kindergartner of hurting her daughter, and some of her story was just so full of holes, I was like, I was there when you were talking about this. That never happened, you liar. I didn't say liar, I said other things. But what the thing is, is that in this series, we've been doing this series on resilience and what you do in your suffering and how your faith won't fail. And it's like, Dad, gum it, God, why did you have to put me in a situation that I'm preaching about? Oh, yeah, because I'm preaching about it. I get to show you guys what it looks like to live through suffering. So this isn't just some theory. Like, hey, it's going to be all good. Let's all just clap and get our tambourines out. And we're all going to be fine. No, we're not. Because there's evil people out there that say evil things against six-year-olds. And then they stir up a hornet's nest and they start gossiping about my wife. And that starts going public on Facebook. And, and they, they come and have meetings with the principals and the, the support staff. And I'm sitting here just like, what just happened? Where did this come from? And I'm still mad about it. I'm still hurting from it. Because who in their right mind picks on a six-year-old? I've never spoken a word to them, them now. It's not just her, but it's them now. Because I'm choosing to rejoice. Because I'm trusting in the promise that this will all be good in the end. I know that we are in a broken world. And there are broken people that want to try to break other people. I didn't do anything to deserve that. It just happened. Suffering will happen. People will insult you. People will drag your name through the mud. People will try and attack you. People will see when you are standing for the cross and when you have integrity in your life, they're going to do everything they can to undercut that. Choose joy now. I don't enjoy this. I don't enjoy what was said about my daughter and my wife. In fact, I was up at the school most of the day on Friday just to protect them because I had no idea what, was, what could have happened. I was like, I'm not going home. This, this woman has free reign to come in and out. I'm, no, I'm going to be here, and I, I don't care what happens. I'm going to be here and protect my family. Integrity is going to win. I don't enjoy that. I don't enjoy spending my day off playing security guard because I'm afraid of what could happen. I don't enjoy that at all. I don't enjoy the accusations made that were ridiculous. I don't enjoy that grown women are picking on kindergartners. I don't enjoy that. I think that's evil. I think that's unjust and, and disgusting. See, when you enjoy something, you don't want it to end. But when you rejoice, you're happy it's over. I am not happy that this is happening to my family. I don't enjoy it, but I choose joy now to be overjoyed later. 
This is what Matthew 5, 11 through 12 says. It says, Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Nothing strange is happening to us. It's happened before. So what do we do next? Well, I want to walk you through this. Verse 19. Look at it for me. It says, So then those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. Commit and continue. Commit yourself and then continue to do good. I want you to catch this though. None of this matters. None of this. None of this rejoicing and suffering. None of this matters at all if your suffering is outside the will of God. It says so in, in verse 15. It says if you suffer, it shouldn't be as a murderer or thief or any other kind of criminal or even as a meddler. You can make stupid choices and have stupid consequences. All right, that's, that's on you, <laughs> okay? None of this matters unless your suffering is in the will of God, for the name of God, for the purposes of God, and the kingdom of God, all right? If you do something dumb, you deserve to be punished. That's called justice. But if you don't do something dumb and you suffer, that's when you're blessed because you know it's for the cross. Now check this out. If you suffer unjustly because of Christ or because of integrity or because of your, your bold faith, we're told what to do. First, you commit. You commit to who? What's it say? Verse 19, commit to who? Key word. Faithful creator. God is faithful, so we remain faithful. God doesn't give up on us. We don't give up on Him. When unjust suffering and accusations and things come at you, you don't bail and go, you know what? I'm going to take this into my own hands. You know, I could have done that. I could have found out where she lived and gone to her house and sat outside and just kind of gone and scout. I could have done all kinds. Like my heart and my flesh went there. I'm like, I want to get revenge. But that's not what we're told to do. We're told to commit ourselves to our faithful Creator. God is faithful, so we remain faithful to Him. And then it says continue. We don't just commit and say, okay, God, you take care of this. No, we, we commit and then we continue to do good. We continue to live for Christ. We continue to have integrity. We continue to rejoice in our suffering. We continue to believe that Jesus' promises will be fulfilled someday. We continue in that. Because a person's choice to suffer rather than deny faith in Jesus reflects the presence of the Holy Spirit already at work. If you choose to rejoice instead of denying Christ, it's proof that the Holy Spirit is in you. And when you commit and continue, that's called resilience. Remember the definition of resilience. The property of a material that enables it to resume its original shape or position after being bent, stretched, or compressed. And over the last five or six weeks, I wonder how many of us have been bent, stretched, and compressed in some way. Your faith has been stretched. Your resolve has been bent to the point where it's almost broken. Or you just feel so much pressure. You're just feeling squashed by the world and by life. None of us is immune to that. But that's what resilience is, is when you commit and continue. So why do we? Isaiah 35.10 sums this up well. I love this. It says, And the ransomed of the Lord will return and come with joyful shouting to Zion, with everlasting joy upon their heads. They will find gladness and joy. And check that last part. Sorrow and sighing will flee away. We rejoice now because this is coming. We rejoice in suffering now. We endure suffering now. When suffering starts to push against us, we know that we're going to bounce back to our original shape because the promises of Jesus hold firm and hold true and hold us stout and resolved. We choose joy now to be overjoyed later. We choose joy now because we're going to come with joyful shouting. We're going to have everlasting joy. We're going to be filled with gladness and joy and sorrow and sighing will flee. When Jesus takes us home, oh, what a day of rejoicing that will be. 
So does it suck when things go wrong? Yeah. Does it hurt? Oh, yeah. And there's any number of things that you guys are going through now where you can just go, yeah, I, that, that hurts. What do I do? This is what you do. You don't put on a fake smile and go, everything's okay. You resolve in your soul. Jesus is better. You trust him that his promises will come true. It's not wishful thinking like, oh, someday soon. No, it will happen. Even if you have to suffer the rest of your life, when you die, you get to be with him. And I'm, I'm begging him every day, come back now. Come to like right now. How cool would that be? Just right now, take us home. So we don't have to do this anymore. <laughs> Suffering well doesn't mean faking happiness. What we do is we endure with supreme confidence that our joy will be made complete in Christ. So we don't we don't enjoy being backstabbed or, or losing friends or not getting invited to something. But we don't enjoy criticism for standing up for what we do. But we choose joy now to be overjoyed. Later. We choose to rejoice in our sufferings now because we know one day soon, not ever. Thank you.